such a peaceful island for victim to explosions gunfire destruction war yeah. Let's start from the beginning. slower pace than what I'm accustomed to in Koro and the rest of the main island of Palau. Why? Because I took the craziest power nap. It's very chill, very quiet, very laid back as what's to be as expected when you arrive here. Population is smaller and there's only so many people on this island. Other than the laid back vibes that this island has to offer, I did come here for one particular historic reason. In the Western Pacific in early September 1944, the war was being carried forward toward eventual final victory by the powerful the amphibious forces which were driving deeper into the enemy's zone of defense. The immediate objective was the group of islands called Polo. The decision on which islands of the group to invade was a difficult one. Ali, my name's Anthony. I'm uh, traveling on Peleliu. Do I need to permission to enter the, the place? There aren't very many tourists here on Peleliu, which means that I have to kind of plan accordingly with what I do. Something one must know when traveling to Palau is that you cannot just go anywhere. Most places around Palau, you need a permit. A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. The war sites here in Peleliu, you do need a permit. I got a permit yesterday. If anybody the permit. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sulang Sh Shari, for your help. I really appreciate it. The largest number of Japanese troops was concentrated on Babel Tua. Less than half as many enemy troops garrisoned Pelalu. The amphibious force which moved northwestward through the far Pacific was to strike at the last two of those islands, Pelalu and Ango. On September 15th, 1944, the assault was begun on Pelalu Island by the men of the 1st Marine Division. This day would change the island forever. Though the battle on shore was expected to be another Tarawa, the Navy complained that they had run out of targets. But there were many installations which the Navy's guns did not even touch. Host at my place was nice enough to lend me her nephew's bike. Thank you for fixing it. Which makes traveling around this island a lot easier. 
Road's starting to change. I heard the road gets a lot more rough the further south you go. This island is small, but it's not as small in one thing going on foot. It's a little bit more of a, a journey. There's nothing like cruising an island on a bike. The armored amphibians moved toward shore, they drew heavy fire from the enemy. A good indication of what was in store on the beaches. This was the first amphibious assault made by the 1st Marine Division to be opposed by the enemy. The first waves hit the beach to the accompaniment of intense enemy mortar and artillery fire. Boats are very close to the beaches now. Invasion Beach on the morning of D-Day, September 15th, 1944. The American landings on white and orange beaches began under a curtain of heavy bombardment by U.S. ships and bombing by carrier-based aircraft. To the troops on the landing vehicles approaching the beach, the shoreline appeared as a continuous sheet of flame backed by a thick wall of smoke. They left alive on those beaches, it's a miracle. White Beach, located about 300 meters west of here, was the most bitterly contested of the invasion beaches. Casualties on the beaches were heavy. The 1st Marine Division was paying dearly for the small strip of coral and sand along Peleliu's western shore. Pillbox crews held their fire until the last moment. As American landing vehicles approached the beach, destroying or damaging many, the loss of landing vehicles delayed the landing of reinforcements. The prediction that it would be rough turned out to be an understatement. American 1st Marine Division sustained 1,300 casualties during the landing. In the Marine Corps, the 1st Division had earned the reputation of drawing operations which entailed easy landing. But at Peralu, this tradition of good luck was dissipated. Take a moment and listen. Prior to Invasion Beach, was the very cause for the battle in the first place. Oh my God. airstrip. Peleliu was to be invaded and captured so that U.S. forces would gain possession of the vitally important airfield on the island. A key to the control of the Western Pacific area. This is the Peleliu airfield, not in use, but uh, it's in the works of being repaved or redone so it can be in use again. The Americans wanted to capture the airfield in order to make a, a successful invasion of the Philippines. So this spot that I'm riding on right now has a lot of historic significance. Wow. objective for which the Marines were fighting so bitterly was the airfield on Peleliu. To seize that airstrip, the exhausted Marines pushed on in a determined effort to gain that prize before nightfall. But the conquest of Peleliu wasn't to be as brief as originally planned. The Peleliu airfield was a substantial complex of buildings and roadways. Remains of these war damaged structures can still be seen in the surrounding jungle. No matter who is fighting who, nature always wins. To hold on to the slim foothold, the Marines had to drive quickly inland to deepen their beachhead. In the face of withering enemy fire, they pushed ahead.
the Japanese air headquarters and this place is huge. I mean, just look at all the bullet holes. The Marines found themselves faced with the necessity of stopping a strong enemy counterattack. The men of the 1st Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, braced themselves for the attack. At 4.50 o'clock, the Marines opened up with everything they had. The enemy counterattack failed completely and ended in a familiar way. Japanese fuel storage bunker. This is one of four that was constructed. The other three didn't make it in the war. It says the bunker became a Japanese strong point that held up the advance of American Marines moving from White Beach towards the airfield. Thick concrete walls were impervious to artillery shells fired at close range. On September 16, 1944, there was a fierce combat at this location with 35 U.S. Marines killed or wounded in assaults. The bunker finally fell after being struck by two 14-inch shells from the battleship USS Mississippi. The bunker was then used by American Marines as an aid station during the early days of the battle. Today, the bunker has been restored for use as a World War II museum. Unfortunately, today I'm unlucky to go inside as it is closed for renovation. I've been told that it's not in a, not in a great state and is told it's due to collapse. You can watch as many documentaries as you want to. But when you're here in person, you can actually see the scars of war. That gives me goosebumps. The battle raged on for nearly three months and left the trail of destruction in its wake. But the war wasn't limited to just Peleliu. It became apparent that a supplementary operation would have to be conducted against an adjoining island, Ngesavas. This small-scale invasion was necessary to deny the enemy the use of a base for his artillery, which was being directed against U.S. troops on Peleliu. Ngesavas was seized without too much difficulty by the thousand Marines. The island was taken quickly, and U.S. losses were what? The invasion of Angaur was made by the Army's 81st Division on September 17th. The men of the 81st landed against light resistance and went about the job of seizing the island from the enemy garrison force. Angaur was not heavily defended, but the enemy had to be wiped out yard by yard. For four days, the GIs pressed the attack on Angaur. On September 20th, all organized resistance ceased. It's hard to imagine what it was like to fight this war on Peleliu. Being only 500 miles north of the equator, it's incredibly hot. A refreshing swim it's not a privilege anyone had during the battle. And that was just one of the many harsh conditions experienced. Casualties here were many for both the Japanese and Americans. The Americans fired tank guns and large artillery directly into the cave mounts and tunnels, and finally used flamethrowers in repeated attacks. There were about a thousand Japanese defenders posted here in early September 1944. Holy crap, man. The army troops edged around the ridge and approached it from the north. The last and final stop on my World War II Peleliu day. Bloody Nose Ridge. The fight for Bloody Nose raged on. In a move coordinated with marine attacks from the sides of the ridge. Week after week, U.S. troops assaulted Bloody Nose Ridge with every weapon available.
bloody nose continued without let up. By the end of September, the enemy was losing control of the island. A number of Japanese soldiers surrendered, but they represented only a part of the force still alive on Peleliu. For every enemy soldier who gave himself up, were still holed up in the caves of Bloody Nose Ridge. On Peleliu, a handful of Japanese troops were taken alive before the island was turned secure. By late November, the enemy was all finished on Peleliu. Taking two key islands in the Palau's, U.S. fighting men had seized a valuable area in the far reaches of the Western Pacific. Palau is a beautiful archipelago with a culture that thrives thanks to the turnout of the war. We all know about the Japanese and the Americans. But what about the people indigenous to this island? Now, any World War II location I ever make it to, I always ask myself, what about the people that were here before? Two of the villages were demolished for the construction of the Japanese airfield in 1938. The other three villages were heavily damaged by war. Peleliu's population was evacuated a few weeks before the American landing. Kulukulubed is the primary village on Peleliu, where residents returning at the end of World War II were resettled in U.S. military Konsen huts, now replaced by Palauan homes. Village sites are vital links to the past and present traditions of Peleliu. The war may have been won by the Americans. The scars of war remain. <laughs>